Good. Okay, today we are happy to have in-person seminar. Uh, uh, Grant Remy from uh, uh, KITP, Santa Barbara. He will talk about the Veneziano variations and how unique are string amplitude. Just uh, from the title, I found it very interesting. Go ahead. Thanks, thanks very much. And, uh, thanks again for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here in person and uh, seeing all of you. So, uh, right, so today, um, despite the title, this is going to be kind of a, a bottom-up, bootstrappy type talk. This isn't really a string theory talk, it's an amplitudes talk. But uh, the answer that we're trying to uh, address in, in our current work is understanding how unique are string theory amplitudes anyway. You know, we've been told that string theory is this beautiful theory, and it is. Uh, its amplitudes have many amazing properties that we'll discuss, but that behooves us to ask the question, uh, are there any other mathematical objects one can construct that accomplish those same miracles? And if there are, can we find those objects within string theory, or do they tell us something beyond it? Uh, so it's an, it's an exciting and uh, high-stakes question to be asking. Uh, so just uh, a few words of introduction and to put this talk into context. Um, I do a great many things across uh, quantum field theory and gravity. I spend a lot of my time uh, bounding the laws of particle physics and uh, EFTs and all that, but I spend a lot of time on GR and, uh, and holography as well. But this talk occupies sort of this corner of parameter space, uh, purely scattering amplitudes and, uh, and things of that nature. And just as, as motivation, uh, the bootstrap method for discovering new physics uh, isn't really so much about high-minded principles of geometry and thought experiments and you know, things involving elevators and trains in, in GR, uh, but is instead uh, asks a, a math question about the S matrix. Is it possible to do this, that, and the other uh, at the level of scattering amplitudes, and what are the constraints that this tells you about amplitudes? And from that, you can get uh, amazing results. You can get, more or less uniquely, gauge theory and gravity. Uh, see, for example, uh, Cliff's really cool elevator-free derivation of GR in, uh, in this review paper. But what hasn't really been asked so much is, what is the analog analogous question for string theory? What is the math question for which string amplitudes provide the answer. And that's what we want to get at. And with the ultimate goal, uh, as I said, is, is string theory in some sense unique? Or if it's not, what is the space of things uh, of which it's a part? So before we can uh, ask those sorts of questions, we have to think uh, more carefully about what is it that string amplitudes do? What are the unique properties uh, that we want to emulate? And you know the, the boilerplate sort of slogan is that you know string amplitudes unify GR and quantum field theory by taming the transplankian uh, divergences associated with graviton amplitudes. But more concretely, how they do this is they they accomplish this feat by adding a tower of massive higher spin degrees of freedom. Uh, you can prove that if you're going to UV complete uh, graviton scattering amplitudes, you can prove that. If, if you're going to do that in a weakly coupled theory, that it must be at tree level uh, by h-bar counting. And in fact, you can also show, as uh, Kems did, that you can't do it without adding higher spin states. And generally, adding higher spin makes any amplitude worse because of extra factors of momentum in the propagator numerator. So you can't add just one higher spin state. Higher spin state, you have to add an infinite tower of such states. And so string theory, uh, answers the question of how to build an amplitude that exchanges some infinite higher spin massive tower of modes consistently at high energies. So uh, concretely, the way this is done for open strings uh, was found in 1968 by Veneziano when he was a young man, uh, and it's this uh, beautiful gamma gamma over gamma structure uh, for the open string amplitude. And so that's concretely what we want to ask in this talk, how unique is the Veneziano amplitude in coupling this infinite massive higher spin tower. Okay, uh, in particular, a, a beautiful property of the Veneziano amplitude is that it can be written as this infinite product here. You see, it's an infinite product of a uh, product of two propagator uh, denominators with some with some numerator factor that you uh, arrange to give you precisely the gamma gamma over gamma, and we'll use that observation as motivation going forward. We'll kind of use that infinite product form as a starting point. 
So what we'll find, uh, just to give you a bit of a spoiler, is that indeed string amplitudes exist in a much bigger space of mathematical objects that accomplish many of the same miracles. So in particular, I'll derive a new multi-parameter uh, space of four particle amplitudes that are Lorentz invariant and describe the infinite exchange of higher spins, satisfying two conditions. Number one uh, is polynomial boundedness. So the high energy behavior is uh, well behaved. Uh, it satisfies either Regging or Frassar, depending on whether you're talking about uh, fixed momentum exchange or high energy fixed angle scattering. And failure of polynomial boundedness generally uh, implies a breakdown of causality or unitarity. At least this has been proven for uh, gap theories, and we'll kind of take that as, uh, as a given. But also, and this will turn out to be really super constraining, each pole in the theory uh, will just describe the exchange of a finite tower of spins. And this happens in string theory too. If you go to the nth mass pole in string theory, you are only exchanging particles from spin 0 to n. You're not exchanging an infinite number of states in a finite uh, mass window. Infinite spin exchange at finite mass would describe sort of an infinitely large fluffy object uh, that has you know, all the partial waves turned on. And such objects are interesting. I wrote a paper with uh, Newton last year on basically adding infinite spin towers and UV uh, completing graviton amplitudes in that way. But again, in this talk, we'll take a kind of a conservative view of locality and enforce finite spin exchange. And accomplishing both one and two simultaneously while adding in a bunch of uh, higher spin states is almost impossible. This, incredibly, this is incredibly constraining at the level of amplitudes, but still possible to satisfy. Now, so are you going to explain exactly what it means to, to be uh, each pole describes a finite tower of spin? Yes, yeah, I will, I will eventually be drawing you the, the full chu frauchi plot for this theory that shows you the masses and spin states. Okay. Yep, yep. But before I get into what we did, I want to go over a little bit of lost history uh, with you, which is that well, first of all, historically, string amplitudes, of course, predate the realization that the theory was about strings at all. Uh, it predates it by about a year um, before people realized, hey, Veneziano's amplitude is describing string modes. But also, and this is the lost history, also satisfying conditions one and two is a sort of Q-deform generalization of the Veneziano amplitude discovered by Daryl Kuhn one year later and tragically forgotten, or virtually forgotten, for decades. You can see the inspired plot here of, of the citations. But in the past literally year, there's been a recent surge of interest uh, with people exploring unitarity of the Veneziano amplitude in the sense of partial wave unitarity. And uh, last summer, Juan and I were looking at string amplitudes that also exhibit similar properties to uh, Kuhn's amplitude. So Kuhn's amplitude looks like this. Uh, it, again, has this kind of double propagator structure with an infinite product, just like uh, Veneziano. But uh, here I'll tell you what sigma and tau are in a little bit. But it has this parameter q. And it turns out when q goes to 1, this object here uh, reduces to the Veneziano amplitude. So some of you might be familiar with the field of q deformations in mathematics, q deformed integers and all that. This is literally applying all of that to uh, physics, though Lacun didn't realize it at the time he wrote his paper. Uh, so sigma and tau here are just shifted and rescaled uh, Mandelstam, so their Mandelstam is transformed uh, by an affine transformation. And what's notable about the Kuhn amplitude is that there's an accumulation point in the spectrum. So Q is a parameter that's generally less than 1, and as Q, uh, as I said, as Q goes to 1, you get Veneziano. But if Q is finitely less than 1, then Q to the n goes to 0, as n goes to infinity, and you have an accumulation point uh, at sigma equals 0. So it's kind of like hydrogen in that way. You have a bunch of states that are clumping closer and closer together. And above the accumulation point, you get this ionization-like structure. You get these branch cuts. So it's, it's, it's literally like you're sort of uh, throwing off some uh, electron or something. So what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to ask if Kuhn found everything or if there is even more. And so we're going to generalize uh, his construction even further to find new string-like amplitude. So let's get into uh, the construction. Um, any 
any questions before we do that? Please, you know, stop me in the time. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a lot more about the mass dimension of the spring energy? Should it be like dimensionless or? Yeah. Um. Right. Good. So, for for our purposes, you know, if you're if you're in d equals four, four particle amplitudes are dimensionless in d equals four. Right. There's there's a dimension dependent scaling of mass dimension, but these are just four particle amplitudes that have external scalars. I'll be talking about. Um, actually, I should, I should say a bit about this right now. Um, so, what is the Venetianum amplitude anyway? What is it describing? Um, it's describing, uh, in the bosonic uh, string theory, it's describing the scattering of four tachyons. All right? So, which they're the lowest uh, lying modes in the bosonic string. Um, but, if you dress it with a, with a gauge field to the fourth form factor, so you multiply this scalar amplitude by an f to the fourth, it gives you the appropriate amplitude for two to two you know, quote unquote gluon scattering in the superstring. So in the bosonic string, it naturally wants to live in 26 dimensions. For the superstring, it wants to live in 10 dimensions. But amazingly, you get the exact same object in both cases, the only difference being whether, whether alpha naught is zero or one. So if alpha naught is one, it's the bosonic string tachyon. If alpha naught is one, sorry, if alpha naught is zero, it's the uh, gauge field modes of the superstring. But here, for the purposes of this talk, just imagine that the external states are scalars with some masses that will ultimately be dictated by, by alpha naught. Okay. Sorry, can alpha naught become an, um, okay. Alpha naught can be either zero or one, right? It, can it, alpha naught be a continuous parameter? It, it, it's, it's going to be an arbitrary real number. Okay. In this talk. Yeah. In, in known string theories, it's either zero or one, but yeah, we'll be, we'll be maximally agnostic okay, from that okay. perspective. In fact, I'll eventually draw you exclusion plots of you know, where is it unitary and where is it not unitary. Oh, okay. Good. okay. Right. So, um, like I was just saying, we want to consider a uh, scattering amplitude with external <coughs> scalars. Uh, we'll assume cyclic invariance, so crossing symmetry, um, not full Bose crossing symmetry, but at least uh, as t goes to ts crossing symmetry. So if you like, you could think of this as you know, the exchange of, or the scattering of like colored scalars or something uh, so to enforce just that kind of crossing. And we'll assume only tree-level poles uh, for now, so simple poles just like in string theory. And you can imagine kind of full simplifying the amplitude to write uh, any amplitude as some product over a bunch of poles uh, in the S and T channels with some uh, giant numerator. We'll also assume a well-ordered spectrum, so uh, all the m squareds are in order. We can do that without loss of generality, just by relabeling. But the product isn't yet well-defined here, because we have to make a binary choice. Is the spectrum bounded or unbounded? Right? Because we want this, this product to converge. Uh, for now, because it'll be actually nicer, we're going to assume a bounded spectrum, and we'll talk about the unbounded case later. So that means we have some accumulation point and infinity in the spectrum. Um, I should note uh, that the, the recent work of uh, Simone and company, uh, which considered whether or not the Veneziano amplitude was asymptotically unique in, in the far UV, uh, assumed a priori the absence of accumulation points. So nothing I'll say in this talk actually contradicts their, their no-code result. Uh, I further want to define shifted and rescaled Mandelstam variables, sigma and tau, which are related to S and T like this. This is a nice parameterization because as S scans from M infinity squared down to M naught squared, sigma just scans from zero to one. And we'll define a spectrum function, f of n, that also scans from zero to one as we step through the Ms. Uh, having said all that, a nice product on SOTS uh, one can write down is the following. So again, it has this uh, double propagator uh, in the denominator, just like the Kuhn amplitude. And now we have uh, but an arbitrary spectrum function, f, and arbitrary functions g and h that we're going to try and fix. Here w is some prefactor. You can ignore that for now, but it will come back later. So we have a math goal. Find the functions f, g, and h that satisfy properties 1 and 2, polynomial boundedness and finite spin exchange. And it's finite spin exchange that will really rear its head. Uh, can I explain a little bit why you choose this uh, particular form or product answer? Right. This is, this is completely an aesthetic choice for now. Um, uh, the, but it's, it's well motivated because uh, both the Kuhn amplitude and the Veneziano amplitude have 
a product structure of exactly this form. So we're right now just trying to ask, is that all there is even within this restricted Okay, answer? okay. Yeah. And it turns out that there's more even within this uh, relatively restricted uh, ensemble. Okay. I mean, yeah, it, it's, well, it's sort of hard to write down something much more general that has an infinite product form like this, but you could say who cares about the infinite product form anyway, which would be a sort of orthogonal question. Okay. But we're going to take that as a given. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about the numerator? Is there a reason to the Well, okay, so we want, um, we want to write down a numerator that is uh, manifestly convergent. Uh, for, for reasons that you'll see in a minute, I want to construct this infinite product such that both the numerator and denominator converge separately. So that's obviously the case for the for the denominator, right? Um, f here is is a is by definition a finite function. It just goes from zero to one. Uh, so the, these terms all converge. But I want uh, I want this term to also converge, and I want it to be well behaved in the deep UV. So I don't want to have any explicit uh, positive powers of sigma and tau. That's the one over sigmas and one over taus. So, from that perspective, it's a natural object to write down. But again, we're we're taking this structure as just a given and seeing and seeing what we can what we can find. Yeah. In the spirit of preventing you from getting to your next slide, uh, what about the accumulation point? Do we know any theories that have such an accumulation point? I mean, like QCD probably doesn't. String theory, I don't think does. Uh, it it does. Um, it does. So well. Okay. The hydrogen atom has an accumulation yeah, point. Yeah, I agree, but that's uh, not a field theory. Right. Uh, so one of the one of the things that Juan and I did last summer was wrote down explicit uh, string constructions that have accumulation points. So what you do is you take anti center space, you take a D brain, um, and put it at fixed z, fixed Poincaré z coordinate, mm -hmm. and then you take an open string and attach its two ends to the D brain. And that system, if you scatter those objects or if you spin them or whatever, uh, you can show they have accumulation points in their spectrum. More or less why is because if you, so let's talk about the spinning string. If you spin it faster and faster, uh, its endpoints move apart, but uh, the string kind of wants to minimize its length more or but less. You, but you verse, here's the, I, what I kind of was thinking, there are no states above the accumulation point. Yeah. No, but there, well, there are states, there's, an, there's a continuum above the accumulation point. So in the Kuhn amplitude, you have a bunch of simple poles, uh -huh. and then when you hit the accumulation point, you have a blob branch cut. Oh, okay. So it looks, like, it, it looks like you get a continuum. Okay. And we're actually going to get the same thing here. We'll be forced into it, uh, which is really cool. Uh, sorry, may, maybe I got it wrong. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you, you, you said it before saying, uh, for the Simon, the paper, they prove one is the end is only uh, 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 consistent the amplitude under assumptions as no uh, accumulation point. What, what they so, prove precisely is assuming that there's no accumulation point, the Chu Frouchy plot looks asymptotically Veneziano. So it asymptotically. Uh, oh, asymptotically, but like not exactly. Uh, not exactly Veneziano. Right, not necessarily exactly Veneziano, just asymptotically. And also, my understanding of what they proved is that. Not that you don't necessarily get exactly the Veneziano amplitude, but at least you get um, the the same Chu Frouchy plot in that you should have have spins roughly from zero to n as um, on the nth pole. Okay, but, 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 but maybe I got it. Does the Veneziano amplitude have an accumulation point or not? The, Vene the Veneziano amplitude does not have an accumulation point, but it's in some sense a limit of the amplitudes that do. Ah, yes, okay, let's say, if I understand correctly, what I'm trying to do, you're saying, you assume there is a accumulation point. Right. Now they are saying, you take, will you take some limit to yes. see what you get? Yeah. And yeah. the Veneziano amplitude is what you can get. You, you can get the Veneziano amplitude as a limit of everything. Oh, okay, okay, I think I got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, good. Um, the one other thing I wanted to say before moving on to the next slide is, um, it's interesting that uh, sort of exotic product amplitudes of the form, you know, 1 over s minus m squared, 1 over t minus m squared, with this infinite spin exchange um, on the whole, have shown up in various contexts, including at the corners of the EF dihedron, as, as Simone and company showed, or in the context of these uh, kind of non-local, funny um, unitarizations of graviton scattering that Newton and I came up with uh, last year. But what's 
interesting about what we're going to do is even though each individual term in the product has this exotic structure of an infinite number of spins, there's also infinite cancellation, which will leave us with an exactly finite number of spins on each pole. And that infinite cancellation is accomplished by these functions that live in the numerator. So that's what we're going to do next. So, okay, this is probably the most uh, complicated slide in terms of different uh, moving parts, uh, but we'll walk through it slowly. So we had this prefactor, we have this numerator, and we have the poles in the sigma and tau channels. And what we want to do is compute the S-channel pole at mass level K. So that's where sigma is F of K. All right. Um, so as I said, the tau uh, denominator a priori makes uh, the residue non-polynomial. So let's require that uh, in this infinite product, all but a finite number of factors uh, in the tau dependence cancel. And we'll call that finite number of factors P of K. And this is actually a crucial point where we're generalizing. So in the Veneziano and Kuhn amplitudes, uh, P of K is just equal to K. Uh, but there's no a priori reason that has to be true. P of K could be any finite number. So let's be maximally agnostic. All right. So, okay, we're going to extract uh, the K pole uh, in the sigma channel and call that R sub K. And so we have this tau-dependent infinite product, where here uh, sigma has been replaced by f of k. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to carefully relabel some things. So we're going to take uh, the numerator, and this is where it was crucial that I built this uh, onsat such that both the numerator and denominator separately converge. We're going to peel off the first p of k factors of the numerator and take that as our tau-dependent. And then we're going to relabel the indices in the remaining terms so I can write it as, again, an infinite product of equals to infinity. All right, so this is just a relabeling so far. But then what we want uh, in order to make the sort of spin tower truncate, we want all the tau dependence in this final infinite product to cancel, leaving us with tau dependence only uh, here in the first P of K terms. So that's uh, making all this cancellation happen is where, where all the magic is that we're going to get to. Okay, any questions on, on what's going on there before I, before I show you how that, how that happens? Okay, right, so requiring that the infinite tower of spins truncate uh, gave us a constraint. Uh, it's a two variable, so n and k dependent, consistency condition on the functions p, f, g, and h. And here it is, and the requirement is, is that this phi function vanishes at all integers n and k. So, like I said, in the Kuhn amplitude, it was assumed that p of k is k, but will be more general. But let's first figure out what p of k can be. So let me define a new variable r, which is just n plus p of k. We'll well, algebraically so, 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 so basically you're saying that the, the residue of the pole and some S channel pole has um, Degree p of k, the, the the residue of the is a poly, the residue of the k s channel pole is a polynomial in t of degree p of k. That's right. Yeah. That's what you're referring. Yep. Yep. That's what we're referring. Right. So now we want to figure out what can p of k even be. Right. Um, so we're going to solve for phi of r minus p of k comma k. All right. So we we do that and we find this kind of infinite this interesting recursive. Uh, relation for f, which we can plug back into the right-hand side, and we get literally this. f of k is f of r minus p of r minus p of k. And we can invert f, because we're just evaluating this on the integers, and the m squareds are well-ordered. So we can invert it on the positive integers, and one finds that p of k then just has to equal k plus alpha, where alpha is just some constant. It's some uh, non-negative integer, it's 0, 1, 2, etc. So this is a main area where we're going to be generalizing. Alpha was zero in previously uh, looked at amplitudes. So now we want to find f, g, and h, now that we know p. And in general, that's a really hard discrete math problem. Uh, some guys at UCLA have been looking at some different discrete math approaches for special cases. But a, a particularly nice way of thinking about this is to assume that f, g, and h are, instead of just maps from the integers to the integers are actually functions on the reals. And in fact, we'll assume that they're smooth. We don't need that they're 
infinitely differentiable, but we will need that they're four times differentiable. So let's assume that. And let's define the different derivatives of phi with respect to n and k. So we'll call it phi ij. And we're going to take derivatives and fix those all to zero in turn, because phi is identically zero, remember. So if we fix the, uh, the first two derivatives to zero, evaluated at the same integer, we find a relation uh, for h in terms of f and g. All right, so we'll use that going forward. Fixing the next two derivatives, we get a relation for g in terms of f alone. And fixing one more derivative, we get a fourth order differential equation for f. And what wasn't pointed out before, and it's kind of surprising, we don't really know where it comes from or why it should be here, is that you can express this as a Schwarzian derivative. All, that's, all this is telling you is that the only way to solve this spin truncation constraint is for the Schwarzian derivative of f to be a constant. And for reasons uh, that we're choosing with the benefit of hindsight, I will write that constant as minus a half log squared q. It's just a constant I can label it however I want. Uh, you assume it's negative constant. Here, q can even be complex. So oh, okay. Let, let's assume q is. is con okay, that's fine. Thing. So this is just a formal relabeling. Mm. Ultimately, you're right, but yeah, okay. for for reasons that we haven't yet fixed. Okay. So there's a general solution. It's just the Mobius transformation of q to the n. So the the spectra that allow you to spin truncate are representatives of SL2R. So they're just these uh, objects. And G and H can be uh, simply gotten from, from what we found on the previous slide. But now we want to fix some of the constants, A, B, C, and D. Uh, from the definition of F, remember we defined F so that F of 0 is 1 and F of infinity is 0. Um, we've also defined F to be monotone, so we need Q to be real and, and positive and not equal to 1. And we also observe that there's, there's this invariance. One can send Q to 1 over Q, but that has the effect of just swapping A and B and C and D. So without loss of generality, let's take Q less than 1. We then have this general form for F. We have just one more free parameter, Xi. And now we want to fix Xi. So in order to do that, we have to go back and remind ourselves what is it that we've accomplished. Um, ultimately, as, as Marcus uh, said, um, we want the residue, the kth residue, to be a P of k order polynomial in T. We ultimately will accomplish that, but that's not quite what we have so far. What we have is that rather than a finite polynomial in tau, we have a finite polynomial in 1 over tau. There's this non-locality that we've gotten uh, because of the product form of our ensembles. So, But remember, we have that W function, and we need to choose W in order to cancel the non-local factor. So let's do that. For simplicity, let's assume W is a monomial uh, on the residue. So uh, we can write it in terms of these arbitrary functions, M and N. And we can enforce crossing symmetry. So that fixes M and N as uh, a log up to a constant. And we need N to be integer valued on the pole. So that fixes Xi equals 0. It fixes X, y, uh, X and Y in terms of some integers, some non-negative integers, alpha, beta, and gamma. And we can redefine the normalization, e to the z, as just uh, c, alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, that's allowed to depend on these integer parameters that define the theory, but it's not allowed to depend on the pole number. It's just an overall uh, normalization. So when the dust settles, uh, we have the following amplitude, which is our final uh, result. Uh, it's a multi-parameter generalization of the Kuhn amplitude. So it depends, like, like the Kuhn amplitude, on Q, but it also depends on these uh, collection of non-negative integers, alpha, beta, and gamma. And what we want to do now is kind of understand some of its physical properties. Uh, so going back to the physical mantle stamps, I can write sigma and tau in terms of uh, S and T. So here, mu squared just defines the overall mass scale. That, that one's not important. But delta here is a parameter that tells you what's the mass of the external state that you're scattering. So delta is kind of like alpha naught in the string amplitude. So uh, the mass of the external state is just going to be mu squared delta. And in general, the spectrum of this guy is mu squared times delta plus the nth q-deformed integer. So um, 
I don't know if you've all seen the Q-deformed integers before, but just to remind you, uh, they're defined uh, as follows. So uh, the Q-deformed integer is 1 plus Q plus Q squared all the way up to Q to the n minus 1. So when you take Q to 1, you just get the integers. And like I said, we have external states mu squared delta. So not only is it clear that we limit to the Regi trajectory as Q goes to 1, but importantly, the spin structure compared to Kuhn or Veneziano is extremely different. Rather than spins from 0 to k, we have spins going, to, going from 0 to what I'll call L max of k. And L max of k is uh, alpha plus beta plus 1 plus gamma times k. So when alpha, beta, and gamma are 0, this is just k, but in general, it uh, enhances the maximum spin on, Sorry. on a given pole. Alpha, beta, gamma are real number or uh, uh, gamma are in, are integer. integers? Uh, integer, okay. Integers. okay. Yeah. Positive yeah. integer? Pos uh, Non-negative integer. Non-negative, yes. okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the only real parameters are q and delta. Okay. Right, so uh, as I said, I'm going to uh, show you the chu Crouchy plot. So what, what this means is that the Reggie trajectory is customizable. So here, q equals 1. Uh, these are the states of string theory. So you just have uh, you know, regularly spaced poles where you uh, march up with one more uh, state uh, on each pole. But here, if you, if you take q to be less than 1, uh, what you find is that rather than some infinite Regi trajectory, you get a logarithmic Regi trajectory that uh, goes off to infinity at a finite mass value. So that's what I mean in, in the sense that, uh, that the Regi trajectory is, is a certain limit of these amplitudes. So this is the case for alpha, beta, and gamma all zero. So this would be the spectrum for the Kuhn amplitude. But then what happens if we turn on alpha, beta, or gamma? Well, if we turn on alpha plus beta, uh, so alpha and beta contribute in the same way to the Chu-Frauchi plot, even though they contribute differently to the amplitude. So I'll plot them here uh, degenerately. Alpha and beta uh, contribute additively to the maximum spin on a given pole. They just contribute, you know, one extra spin or two extra spins or whatever uh, in, a, in a constant way. But gamma is different. Gamma contributes uh, multiplicatively. So on the, on the first pole, you have maybe one extra state if gamma is one. On the second pole, you have two extra states, etc. Sorry, if I want to take this limit that there's no accumulation point, do I need to take m infinity go to infinity? M infinity goes to infinity, yeah. Yeah, in, in the in the lab, yeah. Then this uh, uh, variable you plot in the x in the x axis is go to infinity, right? Yeah, that's right. So so, so what does it mean to right. go to infinity? So yeah. so in this first plot, I plotted m k squared minus m yeah, squared. Yeah, that is okay. Yeah. Right, right. So but, these these second plots are I've just chosen to plot it that way so that the so that the accumulation point is all at the same place. I wouldn't have had to do that. I could have instead plotted m k squared minus m not squared. Ah, okay, okay, I agree. Yeah. It, it wouldn't have mattered here because here, in, in this plot, I'm fixing q equals mm. two-thirds. So m infinity goes to infinity corresponds to q goes to one. So that's oh, oh, that's why q not cannot, okay. Yeah. So it's at, at the accumulation point, there's really an, an infinite number. Of an infinite factors. tower, yeah. So if you just literally stretch that plot in a naive way, I would think that the the mass gap, can you, can you stretch the, you can let the, my question is, can you let the accumulation point go to infinity while keeping the mass difference between the low-lying states fixed? Yeah, yeah, certainly. You can do that. Uh, yeah, in fact, I mean, so you can is see... The difference is controlled by something like mu squared or something which is independently... Right, right, yeah, so in units of mu squared, the mass right. difference between the, first, the zero state and the first state is always one. Yeah. So that's okay. always absolutely fixed. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, right. So, all right, so now that I've shown you what alpha and beta and gamma do to the theory, let's actually ask about the kinematic limits, about the IR and UV uh, behavior. Sorry, just one more question. If you do that, are the low-lying states evenly spaced? If you send the accumulation... Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. So you're evenly mean, spaced, you can't... Yeah. yeah, so that just corresponds to taking Q goes to 1 here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good, okay, so um, the low energy limit corresponds to sigma and tau around one. Remember that's, uh, that corresponds to the 
zero state that we're scattering. Um, and in that case, you can read off uh, the IR behavior of the amplitude, and it's most convenient to write it in terms of what are called Q Pockhammer symbols. Uh, they're just these particular infinite products of 1 minus r times q to k. All right, sorry, not infinite products if we put a subscript n. Uh, with subscript infinity, it's an infinite product. And if I take massless external states for simplicity, uh, what this looks like is just uh, a cubic scalar theory. You get 1 over s plus 1 over t. So nothing terribly exotic uh, in the IR. Uh, at high energy fixed angle scattering, we can read off what the amplitude looks like. So log of the UV amplitude looks like alpha plus beta times this uh, log sigma tau plus uh, 1 plus gamma over log Q times this funny double log, log sigma log tau. And this is a hallmark of the Kuhn amplitude. This has sort of poor behavior at mod moderately high energies. You get uh, this power law. Uh, growth that goes like sigma times tau to the alpha plus beta. But at super high energies, uh, the double log wins, and what you get is that the amplitude goes like e to the log sigma log tau over log q. And this is exponentially soft, because remember log q is negative, because q is less than 1, so this just kills any power law behavior. So it's qualitatively similar to uh, a string amplitude in that way. Um, we can also look at the Reggie limit, so large s fixed t rather than fixed uh, angle. And in that case, we get a sig sigma to the this log t type Reggie uh, behavior plus alpha plus beta. And if you remember your Reggie bound, what one wants is that constant to be at most two. So we can, if we want to enforce Reggie boundedness, require that alpha plus beta is less than or equal to two. Um, uh, just a few words about branch cuts. As we've seen at high energies, we get this uh, log A goes like minus log minus S log minus T. Um, as I said, the Kuhn amplitude exhibits the same structure. And uh, the paper of Karen Hu et al. kind of complained about this in 2016. They conjectured that this funny double log might be unphysical. But that's too fast because, as I alluded to earlier, uh, these sort of D-brain and ADS constructions that Juan and I looked at uh, exhibit exactly the same log A goes like minus log S log T uh, behavior at high energies. So if we believe string theory is consistent, which we all do, uh, we have to kind of live with this. And you can't exclude the Kuhn amplitude on that basis alone. And indeed, what, what this is telling us somehow is that there is an ionization process happening uh, above, above an accumulation point. Right. So we're not going to talk about uh, the branch cut more in this talk. I think that would be something worthy of investigation to try and understand really what's going on, what are the states that are being thrown off uh, by these objects. But um, instead... Just, just very briefly, is, is, uh, is the claim that you could ask about the very high energy behavior as you go along the branch cut there? That, yeah, right. Well, knowing what that is, is that yeah, that I mean, the, so so that's the regime where where we looked. So if you when when we computed high energy fixed angle scattering, we actually oh. looked at sigma and tau goes so to minus infinity. Okay, good. Thank yeah. you. So if something was going to go wrong, you'd you'd see it there. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, I now want to reduce this to the Kuhn amplitude to see exactly how is it related. So as I mentioned, that's the case alpha beta and gamma all equal to zero. But we could also kind of view it in a different way. So let me redefine my momentum parameters and my Q parameter in terms of various powers of alpha, beta, and gamma. And in that case, our general amplitude can be written as some funny kinematic prefactor times this branch cut times our original infinite product, over, but in terms of these new uh, tilted variables, but instead of marching over the integers, we march over these shifted and rescaled integers. And so you could ask, you know, could we have originally just started from our ansatz and said, well, we'll generalize by instead of taking the product over the integers, taking the product over whatever your favorite subset of the integers is, over the primes or whatever. Um, no. It turns out you can prove, and that's, I mean, that's kind of the upshot of our construction, but the only available subsets of the integers that work in order to kill off the infinite spin tower and get this finite remaining spin tower 
are exactly these kind of affine transformed integers. Right. Uh, so now let's reduce to the Veneziano method. <coughs> so we want a smooth limit as q goes to 0 or q goes to 1. So we're going to dress our coupling with various factors of q just to make life simpler. Well, we can do that. These are just constants. And that means that if we define the q gamma function, so this is again from the math literature, this is a, a nice function that goes to the gamma function we all know and love when q goes to 1. In that case, our amplitudes can be written very compactly. Uh, it's just uh, various factors of q, various kinematic factors, times a gamma gamma over gamma that looks like Veneziano, but in terms of the q gamma functions. And what's inside is not minus s and minus t, but minus log sigma over log q. And this goes to s and t in the q goes to 1 limit. So this is, in a sense, the natural way to write this. And this means that taking q goes to 1 is quite simple. Uh, the mass spectrum reduces to Regi as before. And our amplitudes become something that looks a lot like Veneziano, but isn't quite. Um, so remember, delta is like minus alpha naught. This looks like Veneziano, except that the bottom gamma function has been shifted by minus a non-negative integer. Or equivalently, this is Veneziano times some kinematic prefactor in the q goes to 1 limit. Uh, so it, it's like Veneziano, but this spins from 0 to k plus alpha. What's interesting also is that the beta and gamma dependence totally goes away uh, when q goes to 1. You can only see that in the q deformed case. Right, so now we're going to actually enforce unitarity in the partial wave sense. Uh, but any questions before uh, doing that? So we're going to leave the construction behind now and now kind of do, do things both analytically and numerically in terms of reading off partial waves. Uh, okay, I'm a little bit like lost. Is, uh, okay, you're trying to say uh, you want to generalize this string amplitude, right? For the, you, you, what is the end of you, you saying is a scattering of string? Yeah. But uh, what are these ones? These are scattering ah, of what? Really good. Uh, we, we don't know. No okay. one knows yet. Um, uh, what, well, right. So, one of the ways that you can know that the Veneziano amplitude is about strings yeah. is that there's uh, the integral representation of Euler's beta function. Okay. So, the Veneziano amplitude is Euler's beta function evaluated okay. at S and T. Sure. Um, you can write that as an integral over uh, with, some, with some dummy variable that turns out to be um, a, a world sheet parameter. This is like the Koba Nielsen form of string amplitudes. And so that tells you that, oh, okay, this is describing a world sheet, so therefore this is describing scattering of strings. Mm -hmm. So the, the then corresponding question would be, mm -hmm. well, is there a, an integral form of the Kuhn amplitudes yeah. or of our generalizations mm -hmm. of the Kuhn amplitudes? Um, and can that tell you what, what are the fundamental degrees of freedom? It's not known, no integral representation of either our new amplitudes or indeed the old Kuhn amplitudes is known. Uh, there is such a thing as what we'll Q integration, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which actually involves discrete sums and which becomes Riemann integration in the Q goes to one limit. So maybe, there's, maybe the Kuhn amplitudes are describing some discretized version of the stream world sheet in some way, but that's just me being the completely conjectural. Okay, okay. Uh, another thing, okay, so you are not requiring that a graviton scattering be unitized, right? Did so you require we, that requirement? We haven't said anything about gravitons yet, yeah. because um, the Veneziano amplitude isn't full Bose symmetric, it's just S and T symmetric. So, yeah. so the Veneziano amplitude doesn't enter graviton scattering. That's the Virasor Shapiro amplitude, which we'll come to at the end of the talk. Oh, okay. But uh, so right now, I've been talking about open string scattering rather than closed. No, no, rather than closed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got okay. it. Yeah, great question. I mean, another question related to that would be, you know, is it possible to double copy the Kuhn amplitude into something? Um, nobody knows. Uh, as you saw from the graph, like, there's been virtually no work done on this for like 50 years, and now all of a sudden people are interested. So okay. more people should work on this. Um, okay, so now let's ask ourselves, you know, does this even have a chance of being a theory? Like, before we can ask about world sheet variables and all the rest, you know, if this is just dead at the level of partial wave unitarity, one should stop. 
course, the reason I'm giving this talk is because it's not dead. There actually are uh, unitary regions of parameter space, but that's what we're going to check now. Um, so let's go back to this residue on the kth uh, S channel pole that we extracted earlier, and we're going to do a partial wave decomposition. We're going to be in D dimensions, so rather than Legendre polynomials, we're going to expand it in Gegenbauer polynomials, so they're just the D dimensional versions of Legendre's. Uh, we're taking 2 to 2 scattering, and we're going to write things in terms of the scattering angle of cosine theta, uh, which I'll write as x. And in terms of s and t and the external masses, it's just given by this simple uh, kinematic formula. And unitarity of partial waves will require that all of these AKLs are all non-negative. And the reason is that each AKL is just basically the square of the coupling of the state of spin L, uh, the intermediate state of spin L on the kth pole. So we don't want any uh, ghosts or tachyons, so all of those better be non-negative. Uh, okay, so as I said, there's this maximum spin on the kth pole here. So what we're going to do is we can first just read off the leading partial wave coefficient. So the coefficient of the most highly spinning state. That's the easiest to read off mathematically. It's the leading Reggie trajectory. And in terms of our parameters, it goes like this. And what we can see is that if gamma is odd, that means 1 plus gamma times k is even. So that means there exists some k for which what's in brackets is non-zero. And so that means there exists k for which this object is positive, strictly which means that the leading partial wave coefficient uh, goes like plus or minus, minus one to the k at large k, which clearly contradicts positivity. It's flipping sign as you go back and forth. That means that our initial assumption that gamma is odd must be false, so gamma has to be even, provably, uh, just by uh, unitarity of the leading Reggie trajectory. Similarly, at large k, uh, we, can, we can again read off the general form of the partial wave coefficient, and what we can find, just by kind of squinting at this and making sure that it's positive, is that C has to be uh, of sign minus 1 to the alpha plus beta, and delta, the mass of the uh, external state, is upper bounded. So all in all, demanding a unitarity of the leading Reggie trajectory, uh, one finds, as I said, gamma is even, C has sign fixed by alpha and beta, and if alpha and beta are both zero, delta is at most a third, and if either alpha or beta are non-zero, uh, delta is at most zero, which means the external states are either massless or tachyons. So, you, uh, what, what, what mass unit are you assuming? Sorry? If I assume the mass is like, yes, okay. The, the case pole, what's the mass on the case pole, the function of k? Uh, yeah, so let me... Uh, what's the mass unit are you assuming? Right. Oh, you should right, have some so, scale, so, right? So, sorry? You should have some mass scale, I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's... That's mu squared. Um, oh. uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't enter here, but it enters... Oh, gosh. Here. So it, it enters in the relation between sigma and s. It's just a set of units, so it, it doesn't ultimately matter. Um, when we read off the k residue here, mm -hmm. So this, this twiddle means equals up to positive multiplicative constants that I'm dropping, and so there would be some multiple of mu squared. Okay, so that's mk the function of mu and a k. Sorry? mk the function of mu and a k, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Good. All right. So, so this is what we can get just from the leading rigid trajectory. But of course, really, you should require that all of the partial waves are positive from spin zero up to L max. Doing that gets harder the further you go through the subleading and sub-subleading rigid trajectory. We can push a little farther, the next to maximum spin. So one spin down, uh, we can read off what its form looks like. And this gives us a lower bound on the mass of the external states. And given the upper bound on delta implied by the previous slide, we, have, we find that this gives us an upper bound on beta plus gamma, this integer, as a function of q and alpha. So alpha is an integer, 0, 1, 2, etc. q is just a real parameter, and beta plus gamma is, is upper bounded, uh, as we can see on this contour plot. But OK, let's, uh, 
let's do even more. So we've established a few necessary conditions for unitarity, but how do we know that the set of uh, unitary theories here is non-zero? Uh, will any region survive? And before doing numerics, it's good to reassure ourselves that indeed there will be some region that survives. And we can show that there exist sufficient conditions that guarantee unitarity. Uh, so let's take the case beta and gamma equals zero, so just alpha is, is turned on relative to the Kuhn amplitude. And we can rewrite the residue uh, more simply, like this. And now if we take C of sine minus one to the alpha, uh, and if we rewrite uh, minus tau plus Q to this power as Bx plus C, where X is cos theta, for some B and C positive, that's sufficient but not necessary to guarantee positivity in arbitrary dimension. Because any positive uh, polynomial in cosine theta can always be written as a positive sum over getting more polynomials. It turns out that sufficient conditions uh, to guarantee that B and C are positive is that uh, Q and delta, so the Q parameter and the external mass, lives in this blue region. So indeed, there are unitary regions of parameter space. Uh, right. So now we're going to actually do the full, the real uh, calculation in terms of all partial waves. So uh, just to warn you, this is going to be a giant expression. But after a very long calculation, we can compute all the partial waves explicitly in terms of this uh, enormous nested sum. Um, as is the case for the Veneziano amplitude, this sum is not manifestly positive. It's an alternating sum. Uh, there are terms here that are of indefinite sign. But nonetheless, uh, miraculously, there will be regions of parameter space where it's always positive. So what we're going to do is numerically compute all the partial waves, or at least all the partial waves up to some maximum k where things appear to converge. Uh, and we're going to plot for different choices of the integers, alpha, beta, and gamma, what region is unitary in the q and delta plane. Okay, and we're going to do this for d equals 4. It's not all that qualitatively different for equals 5 or 6 or whatever. Um, ultimately, certain regions uh, have a critical dimension above which it ceases to be unitary, but we'll get to that uh, in a moment. All right, so here I'm plotting individual partial waves. So with different shades, I'm plotting uh, where are all the k equals 0 partial waves positive, or all the k equals 1, all the k equals 2, from 0 up to L max of k, uh, for, again, for different choices of alpha, beta, and gamma. So here, this is the Kuhn amplitude, and all the rest of this are our generalizations. And what you need in order to be unitary is to live in the intersection of all the different teal regions. So for some choices of alpha, beta, and gamma, there is an intersection. For some choices, there isn't. Uh, you'll note that I'm plotting this all for gamma equals 0, because it turns out that turning on gamma always leads to non-unitary. So here, it's just alpha and beta. We're in a constant. Oh, and I've also chosen to, rather than plot in terms of Q and delta, I'm plotting in terms of Q and Q delta, just because it makes things nicer. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's kind of take the intersection of all these regions and see if anything is left over. And indeed there is. So here, different colors correspond to uh, different choices of theory, different choices of alpha and beta, which correspond to different generalizations of the Kuhn amplitude. And here we're plotting the intersection of all the partial waves. So this is where a given theory is absolutely unitary from a partial wave perspective. And there are, there are non-zero regions. So indeed, the theory is alive. Uh, so that's, that's really exciting. Okay. So observations. Um, as I said, there are multiple consistent islands that are present, but apparently only gamma equals zero is allowed. Uh, I showed you that in four dimensions, but apparently it's true in any dimension, at least in any dimension we've checked. For a given theory, that is, for given uh, fixed values of alpha, beta, gamma, q, and delta that fix the amplitude, one can compute a critical dimension, that is, the dimension above which unitarity fails. So how, how is the dimension coming into your onset? I mean, it seemed like it was just a momentum space onset. Yeah, uh, the dimension comes in because the partial waves know about the dimension. So 
even though A doesn't depend on uh, D, oh. uh, the Gegenbauers know about D. Okay. And this is, this is actually how you can find the critical dimension of string theory. Uh -huh. So for, for the uh, superstring, for example, when alpha, beta, and gamma are zero, and when Q equals one, one finds uh, that one finds that uh, partial wave unitarity fails when D is larger than 10. You, you get some partial waves that are negative. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that turning on alpha, again, fixing Q and delta to 1, 0, has the effect of raising the critical dimension. Um, when alpha is 2, the critical dimension jumps up to 11. When alpha is 10, it jumps up to uh, 12. Uh, that might give some hint as to, as to what, what the physics of this theory is, but uh, again, that's an open question. But it's, it's an interesting numerical observation. So now let's, uh, let's kind of try and throw the book at this and try and uh, constrain the theory even more by being maximally conservative uh, and, and see if anything survives, even adding additional requirements. So for delta less than zero, the lowest line states are tachyons, as is the case for the bosonic string. Now, scalar tachyons aren't that bad. They, you know, we have them in the standard model for the Higgs, and they just imply that we kind of roll off to the pure vacuum. But spinning tachyons, you might be more worried about. Uh, they, it's been shown, often lead to ghost condensation. They can lead to violations of uh, Lorentz invariants, even violations of the second law. It might be possible to resolve this via compactification, like if you have some spinning tachyon uh, in, in some direction and you choose to compactify that dimension of space to go to a lower dimensional space where, where that object isn't present. Maybe you can sweep it under the rug that way. But we won't even do that. We're going to try and just forbid spinning tachyons out of the box, which places a lower bound on delta uh, in terms of alpha and beta. Uh, altogether, no spinning tachyons plus unitarity means that if alpha and beta vanish, so coming amplitude, uh, delta has to be between minus one and a third. Whereas if either alpha or beta are turned on, uh, delta has to be exactly zero. So we're scattering exactly massless states. Additionally, we can apply Weinberg's theorem, which forbids interacting uh, massless states with spin bigger than two. That constrains alpha plus beta to be less than or equal to two. And so altogether, at least in four dimensions, we have three distinct consistent families of two-deformed string-like amplitudes. Uh, we have uh, Kuhn here, and then we have the case of alpha equals 1 and alpha equals 2, which are just qualitatively different things. Right, so um, I'm running out of time, so in the last few minutes I'll get back to, uh, someone asked me earlier about what about unbounded spectra, so let's talk about that uh, briefly, uh, though it'll be a shorter story. Uh, we, can, we can take a similar product on such, but slightly different, because we, again, want the numerator and denominator to separately converge. So instead of g times 1 over sigma plus 1 over tau, we're taking sigma plus tau over g. So we're kind of inverting everything everywhere, where f, g, and h go to infinity as n goes to infinity, not to uh, zero. If we again peel off the first p of k factors, where we're being agnostic about what p of k is, and demand truncation of the spin tower, one finds exactly the same condition, phi equals zero as before, but now with the functions f, g, and h sent to their multiplicative inverses. So that means that p of k is again k plus alpha, for alpha is some non-negative integer. And we can fix f of zero and f of one using affine transform. So we get, when all is said and done, we get a general amplitude that looks an awful lot like uh, the amplitude we found in, uh, in the accumulation point case. It's not exactly the same, but it's quite similar. However, doing the unitarity analysis and reading off the partial waves like I did before uh, suggests that this is always non-unitary, except in the Q goes to one limit, where it reduces to the Q goes to one limit of what we found early in the talk. This is similar to what happens to the Kuhn amplitude. It's known that the Kuhn amplitude for Q bigger than 1 is known unitary, and it's unitary for Q less than 1. What's interesting is that seems to hold even with these alpha, beta, gamma type generalizations. So finally, uh, in the last few minutes, what about uh, closed strings? What about full Bose symmetry? So we have the Beer Sauer Shapiro amplitude for closed strings, uh, and it's just this object. It's gamma, gamma, gamma over gamma, gamma, gamma. 
Um, if you are talking about external gravitons, you address this with a Riemann to the fourth prefactor that contains all the polarization information. And let's restrict to massless external states because of this kind of graviton uh, input. So we'll take S plus T plus U equals zero. And we can start with an infinite product ensemble in terms of sigma, tau, and epsilon, where these are affine transformed mental stems. And one can try and play the same game, but there's an immediate difficulty. Either there's a new parameter, uh, zeta, that uh, sigma, tau, and epsilon sum to, and that would have to enter the constraint on f, g, and h, but then be fixed a posteriori, because this is supposed to be the mass of the lightest state. Or, instead of these affine transformed parameters, we could use the actual physical Mandel stems S, T, and U. But if you do that, you get a polynomial residue constraint that doesn't have the Schwarzian form. Uh, you get the derivative of the Schwarzian plus some extra term. And that extra term actually precludes you from finding a solution with the warped Reggie trajectory. So it seems like uh, the only way to try and play this infinite product game with a uh, Virasaur Shapiro like amplitude is to take the Reggie trajectory, so m squared equals n and not the q deformed uh, integer. One can still ask is it possible to deform this in a way that, uh, that, that looks like our alpha generalization? And it is. Um, we, can, we can, for example, subtract alpha from all the uh, gammas in the denominator and it still, it still works. Uh, but you know, so you know, th this is kind of like what we found in the q goes to one limit of the Bruniziano case. It uh, has spins from zero to k plus alpha rather than zero to k on the k pole. But there's a problem even with this, which is if we dress Virasar Shapiro with r to the fourth kinematic data to make this a graviton amplitude, the fact that alpha increases the spin uh, means that you violate Weinberg's theorem. So this object can't be a graviton amplitude, but it could be uh, an identical scalar amplitude in some stringy type uh, theory. But we'll leave further investigation of that to future work. So just to remind you of, of where we started and what we've got, uh, we bootstrapped a, a bigger space of new four-point amplitudes that accomplished all the same uh, feats that the Niziano does. Uh, infinite exchange of higher spin states, but finite tower on each pole, good UV behavior, et cetera. And here's, again, what that amplitude looked like. And importantly, it added customizable spin dependence to the, to the Reggie trajectory, which was really surprising. And even more surprisingly, there are regions that remain fully unitary from the perspective of partial waves. Now, there's a lot of open questions. Uh, it would be nice to have some closed form analytic understanding of the unitary islands. Um, additionally, we could relax some of our uh, technical assumptions rather than, you know, rather than requiring f, g, and h to be continuous. What if they're just discrete value functions? Or what if w, the prefactor, has a more general form? Uh, it would be nice to further investigate the unbounded spectrum case beyond what I, what I told you in this talk. Uh, we could ask, is there a generalization to higher point amplitudes? But the big elephant in the room is what is the underlying physical interpretation of these amplitudes? Are they, are they, str are they strings? Are they some Q discretized version of strings? What, what are these really? And Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Go on. Yeah, thank you for this talk. Um, I'm wondering, I don't even know if it makes sense in this regard, but you have some 1 over mu squared that's kind of like alpha prime. Yeah. In these is very general. Yeah, yeah. Do you, have you tried taking some kind of alpha prime going to zero limit? What kind of, does it even make sense to do that? Um, so, <coughs> the short answer is no, because mu squared and alpha prime really just set um, a scale of units, mm -hmm. right? So, so I can always uh, kind of trivially rescale S and T by, by overall mass scale, and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything to, to the amplitude. So, taking alpha prime goes to zero, well, if I rescale S and T at the same rate, it doesn't do anything. On the other hand, I could interpret your question as taking alpha prime goes to zero as taking S and T goes to infinity, but that would just mean taking the kind of ultra UV behavior of the amplitude, which, which I showed earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Mark had came? Yeah, so yeah. You're, you, you found what you found, but is there a way of somehow uh, characterizing your ansatz in a way that doesn't require you to write down the ansatz? You know what I'm saying? In other words, you know, you right. found, it's, it's interesting that you found generalizations, and yeah. I can take that away from you, but is there any sense, it, it's still not clear to me what, where this ansatz came from. Who ordered the product structure is what, you know, yeah. Yeah, but is there a way to sort of characterize the class of things that you explored? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that, so, more or less you can say that we, we explored all objects that have an infinite product structure where the numerator and denominator are separately convergent, and where the numerator is constrained to have some healthy UV behavior, which is why we had, like, um, no inverse powers of S and T. Beyond that, um, I, I don't have anything to say about why we chose that particular ansatz. I can give you a sneak preview of what we're doing now that ends up finding some similar things from totally orthogonal reasoning, um, which is what we're looking at now is forget the infinite product entirely. There's another miracle that string amplitude has accomplished, and this is what I was telling you about this morning, but I guess I'll uh, tell everyone else, which is string amplitudes enjoy a uh, dual resonance miracle, which is that so you know how the Veneziano amplitude is written as a, as a function of S and T. You can imagine writing, uh, writing it just as a sum over S channel poles, where the T dependence comes entirely from polynomials in the numerator. Or you can write it as a sum of purely T channel poles, where the S dependence comes only from polynomials in the numerator. And how that's even possible is because you have this infinite tower of states and spins, where the you know, the infinite tower of s to the infinity from the spin infinity states kind of resums into into a propagator in s or into a propagator in t. Um, why this is true for string amplitudes is because in particle physics, um, s channel and t channel exchanges are distinct; they're distinct topologies. Whereas if you think about what a string amplitude looks like, where you have some uh, world sheet connecting four open strings. You can deform that smoothly from an S-channel looking object to a T-channel looking object. So what we're looking at right now is, as I said, forgetting the product amplitude structure, just what is the set of all possible amplitudes, possible mathematical functions, that enjoy that dual resonance miracle. And you can ask what are the possible spectra for such an object, etc. And it seems that you can more or less derive as, uh, I mean, these are the only objects we found that this works with. Uh, the Kuhn amplitude spectrum, or the Regi spectrum, so the Q deformed integers, which you get in, in, instead of from the product, from just this requirement of dual resonance. However, we've been finding generalizations of both the Kuhn amplitude and the Veneziano amplitude, uh, again, in a different way than this. So we're, we're just taking spins from zero to n on the nth pole, but asking about this dual resonance miracle. And yeah, there's there's an even bigger space of, of objects, but but you somehow get the Q deformed integers again very naturally from from this totally orthogonal reasoning. More question? Uh, if there's no question, we will thank the speaker again. Thank you for a very nice talk.